Welcome everyone. I'm Brian Gregory with Aldridge. I probably know quite a few of you by the looks of the names on the list here, but we also have some new faces and we're happy to have you join us today for another webinar in our series. And so just wanted to do some quick intros around the room. Um, gentlemen, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, and then after that, just a couple of housekeeping items. But Gray, let's start with you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, my name is Gray Holden. I'm with Higginbotham Insurance Agency. I uh, have been in the insurance business for a little over 30 years. Uh, today, I focus specifically on cyber risk, including technology, uh, errors and emissions, uh, as well as management liability. And I lead that practice for Higginbotham nationwide. Uh, we'll be talking today on the topic of uh, insurance and how that relates to the incident response plan. Thank you. Mike, how about you? Thanks, Brian. Good, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael McLaughlin. I'm an attorney of the law firm of Buchanan, Ingersoll and Rooney. I co-lead our cybersecurity and data privacy practice group, and I lead our cybersecurity incident response team. I've been do, dealing with cybersecurity for, for over a decade at this point. Uh, prior to practicing law, I was a Naval Intelligence Officer and, and last served at U.S. Cyber Command in the Cyber National Mission Force. And today I'll be discussing the legal implications of an incident response uh, having an effective plan and how to make sure that you come out on top. Very good. And last, certainly not least, but our own Seth, how about you? Uh, my name is Seth Purcell. I've been involved in IT and IT security for about 20 years now. And today I'll be bringing the technical response for you guys. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll learn something together. Very good. Without further ado, gentlemen, I will turn it over to you. I'm going to drop off camera. If you see me pop back on, that means we've got a question. So if not, I'll hold those to the end. Uh, to bring the discussion to life, I want to talk a little bit about some real world case studies that are going to illustrate the impact of having or not having uh, an effective incident response plan. Uh, we're going to categorize these in three different ways as we talk about them. The good, obviously, is going to be having an incident response plan, one that you practice, one that you put in place, and, and one that helps you recover from an incident. The bad is having an incident response plan, but not using it, or not having an incident response plan at all. And then the ugly is burying your head in the sand like an ostrich. And so starting with the good, uh, having a comp comprehensive incident response plan is the most important part. And what we found is being the most critical aspect of what, what is going to determine whether or not you are successful in recovering from a cybersecurity incident or whether it's going to be a, a significant burden uh, and a significant liability as you go forward. Not only incident response plans, but tabletop exercises. And so the good, and while I'm not going to discuss specific clients or, or specific organizations, um, the case that, that, that always comes to mind for me as a good is a financial services company that had a comprehensive incident response plan in place. They conducted regular tabletop exercises to simulate potential incidents, and they had pre-approval from their insurance carrier for, for key actions like notifying their customers, like the, the which DFIR firm they were able to use, and what other third-party experts was insurance willing to pay for. In instances where there is not insurance, it's equally as important to have an incident response plan because you need to know exactly what it's going to cost. And if you have a pre-approved or if you have vendors that you regularly work with, it's easier to budget for when an incident does occur. In this specific incident, the financial services firm experienced a sophisticated ransomware attack, but because they had that incident response plan that they had been practicing regularly, their, their SOC team was able to quickly identify the breach. They were able to contain it, notify the affected or the, the important individuals within their organization and bring together a team within one to two hours. The company had the pre-approval templates all ready to go. They had the engagement letters already signed, and they had the pre-approval from insurance. And in that case, they were able to get the DFIR firm right on the network immediately to mitigate damages as much as possible, contain the risk, and immediately move on to recovery. This type of incident is this type of incident was able to be recovered, or they were able to recover within a matter of days to one to two weeks which is incredibly fast when you're dealing with an incident. Many incidents can go months, and in the case of, of some that, that would have follow-on liability for class action can go years. So the faster that you can identify an, an, identify an incident and begin the recovery process, the better. The bad is a case that involved a retail company. There was no incident response plan in place. The organization suffered a major data breach and it compromised millions of customer credit card records. 
And because they had no incident response plan, it was chaotic and slow. And the threat actor was able to move around in their network and identify the most critical information, the type of financial information that puts their customers most at risk, identify that and exfiltrate it. Because they had that amount of time and the, the company itself was in a state of chaos, they weren't able to respond effectively. They weren't able to contain the incident and it became much worse than it would have been otherwise. And all of that was because they didn't have a plan in place and they weren't able to respond effectively. And then the ugly, of course, is the ostrich approach. Any organization that takes the ostrich approach and just decides that they're going to bury their head in the sand is, is not a response. Uh, as we've seen across the board, and particularly with ransomware, this information doesn't stay secret very long. And those organizations that get hit, it becomes public very quickly. And if you're in a highly regulated, highly regulated industry, it's something that you need to take into consideration because not only is there potential for class action liability, but there's potential for significant regulatory liability as well. And so the key takeaway is that we need to make sure that uh, the, the key aspect is being prepared. An incident response plan is a critical facet of that, which we'll talk about extensively here, but it's also practicing that incident response plan. And we'll get into that as, as we go. So with that in mind, and with that as the, the, the framework, what is an incident? What is a security incident? A security incident is an event that jeopardizes the integrity, confidentiality, or availability of information on systems, uh, information systems, or of the data that resides therein. This includes unauthorized access to systems, it's data breaches, or it's also any, any activity that could disrupt normal operations. This includes insider threats. Um, in, in some cases, depending on the definition, it could also include things like the CrowdStrike outage. Whether or not that's an incident depends on the specific definition you're looking at, but it certainly can have significant impact on an organization. But it's important to note that not every security event should be considered an incident or a breach. These are actually legal terms. For instance, a minor login failure due to a forgotten password uh, is a security event, but it's not necessarily a security incident. Uh, an employee clicking on a phishing link that immediately takes them to a page that has been blocked by your organization. That would be a security event, but it's not necessarily a security incident. On the other hand, repeated unauthorized access attempts might constitute a security incident, even if they don't get into the network, because it could indica indicate a potential attack or an attack vector. So understanding the distinction between general security events and actual security incidents is crucial. And it helps to prioritize responses and ensure that the resources are allocated effectively to address genuine threats. Now, the distinction also, which is not on the slide, is what is a security breach or what is a data breach? From the attorney's perspective, these are terms that should never be used. Breach has legal consequences. And if you're talking about talking whether it's internally or whether you're talking to external stakeholders, referring to something as a breach raises the specter of liability. You should always refer to things as a security event until they are determined to be an incident requiring an incident response team to respond to the incident. So now that we have a basic understanding of what constitutes a security incident, let's delve a little bit deeper into the distinction between security events and security indicators. A security event, security events in general, they, they occur all the time. They're really the most normal activity that, that occurs on your network. It's, they're, they're generally benign, um, but routine logins, in, in examples of these, routine logins, file access, system updates, things like this are, are potentially security events. They're activities that are part of everyday operation of an organization's information systems. I additionally, security events could be things that, that are anomalous. They could be, they could be software, uh, not vulnerabilities, but they could be updates that don't fully, aren't fully consistent with your operating system, or that could cause your operating system to have some sort of minor failure, or some sort of minor glitch. These are events, we don't really want to categorize them as incidents until it involves a threat actor, until there are significant downtime, until there are significant impacts to the organization. Unusual security indicators are another aspect and something we need to, need to take into account. Security teams in general are trained to investigate unusual security indicators. These indicators might include repeating failed login attempts, unexpected changes in system behavior, or the detection of malware signatures. And unlike routine security events, these indicators may signal a potential threat or an ongoing attack. And this leads, leads to the importance of monitoring and regular consistent monitoring. By continuously looking for these unusual indicators, security teams have the opportunity to identify and respond to potential incidents 
before they escalate into full-blown security incidents or result in, in data breaches. This proactive approach really serves as the cornerstone to effective cybersecurity. So let's take, a, take our discussion a step further. If we look at how security teams involve executive stakeholders in their investigation, this is one of the, the key determining factors of whether, uh, whether an incident is going to be uh, effectively mitigated and taking into account all the business considerations, or if it's going to be more siloed. And those siloed events can become hugely problematic, which we'll talk about in, in a little bit, uh, a few slides down. So, Bringing executive stakeholders into the investigation is important because a security team never operates in isolation. When unusual security indicators are identified and investigated, it's really important to bring in executive stakeholders. And these are everyone from the C-suite to the general counsel, to the, the head of communications, to the head of HR, to the chief operating officer, or those individuals who have a keen understanding of those business operations and the other operations of the organization. This ensures that leadership's well informed and can provide necessary support and resources throughout the investigation, but it also really gets a different angle on the incident itself. Because the IT team may be focusing on how do we bring the network back up as quickly as possible? How do we mitigate damage? Well, mitigating damage containing the incident itself may have unintended business consequences. Taking down M365, for instance, it may be a good way to stop the threat actor from accessing email, but if the organization doesn't have a backup method or a business continuity plan that's going to enable them to communicate directly with stakeholders, that can be a bad day for the company. And so understanding what the business impact of different IT steps or different potential uh, protocols is critically important. Executive stakeholders also play a really pivotal role in determining the severity of an event. They help assess whether the event constitutes a security incident or more critically, that, that data breach. And the distinction is important because it dictates the organization's response and the level of urgency that's required. Effective communication between the security teams and the executive leadership really helps them to make informed decisions quickly. Practicing this and having that be part of your incident response protocol and your incident response plan is important because a collaborative approach is what is going to ensure that the potential risks are evaluated from a technical as well as a business perspective. And that's going to lead to a more comprehensive and effective way to manage the incident itself. So involving executive stakeholders in the security investigation ensures the organization is able to respond swiftly and appropriately, taking into account all the different security and technical measures, as well as the business operations. Managing security indicators, and as, de as depicted on this, this slide, is a matter of when you're able to identify it and what are the actions that need to take place. And in the industry, we typically call this left of boom or right of boom, boom being that explosion of when that security indicator really, really pops on your network. Everything to the left of boom is the preparation side. That's ensuring that you have an incident response plan. That's practicing your incident response plan through tabletop exercises. That's appropriate training for your personnel so they know not to click on phishing links, or if they click on something to immediately notify the security team so that in full investigation or response can take place. Everything to the right of boom, the right of that security indicator, that's the response. That's when you're putting your incident response plan in place. So that security indicator and being able to identify when that malicious or when that unintentional or unauthorized activity occurs is critically important. And the companies, the organizations that are able to effectively identify those security indicators are more effectively able to respond and to put their plans into place. A security incident response plan in general outlines your response to a security indicator that's proven to be a legitimate threat. And so those security indicators, your security, your security team is going to look at them and determine whether or not this is actually a threat and results in an incident, or if it's something that can be mitigated and or ignored. But the plan is what provides the structured approach to managing and mitigating the impact of security incidents. Some characteristics of an effective incident response plan, uh, they, they need to be clear. They need to be current and up to date. They really need to be well practiced. And what that means is the plan needs to be straightforward. It has to be easy to understand. You have to be able to outline specific roles, responsibilities, and actions that are going to be taken during that incident. They also need to be current. If you have a, a call tree or a phone roster or email addresses for the incident response team, those need to be regularly updated. 
if you change your insurance carrier or your insurance policy, you need to make sure that that new insurance carrier is approving the external forensics team or restoration team that's going to come in. That way, the plan is always going to be a living document and it's going to be something that's regularly updated so that it can be put into a place and still be effective. And then it needs to be well practiced. Regular drills, whether they're tabletop exercises or what I like to call cyber fire drills and simulations, they, those types of things ensure that everyone knows what their role is and that they can execute that plan effectively under pressure. When you're in a crisis, having a plan makes all the difference. The, the incident response plan helps to ensure that your response is coordinated and efficient, it minimizes damage, and it really helps to speed up recovery. It also enhances your organization's ability to meet your legal and regulatory obligations and avoiding potential penalties. We'll talk about this in a later slide as well, but there are very specific timelines and notifications, whether it's to state attorneys general, whether it's to regulators or the notifications to individuals that must be very strictly adhered to, otherwise you open yourself up to liability. And so an effective incident response plan really isn't just a, a standalone document. It's a living document. It's a living framework that's going to guide your organization through the complexities of a security incident and the clarity, the currency, and the regular practice are critical in ensuring that you have and maintain a robust response. So here is the left of boom preparation that we were talking about. And this is the preparation part is really key to creating an effective incident response plan. The incident response plan, again, is that framework, it's that document, but making sure that that document is practiced, making sure everyone involved knows their roles and responsibilities is that key aspect. So creating an incident response team that fits your organization and that meets your organizational requirements is one of the most important parts. Looking at your organization, it's going to depend on the size, the complexity as to who's involved. Some companies that are very small or some organizations that are small, they've got a director of IT, they might have a general counsel, and then they have a C-suite along with the, the, the typical uh, other employees. That type of incident response team very well may, be, may include the CEO, where if you have a very large health system that has its own security operations center, a CISO, a CIO, a general counsel, that incident response team is going to look very different. So understanding who is on your internal incident response team and what their roles and responsibilities are is really important. In that team, that's gonna include not only internal personnel, but also external entities that are gonna to help to support or help to augment your team. One of those is legal. And as an attorney, it's that my shameless plug, you wanna have outside counsel who's gonna be part of that incident response team for a variety of reasons. One is specialization. Not all attorneys understand cybersecurity or understand their requirements. Having an attorney that really understands the legal landscape around what to do in the event of a cybersecurity incident, given your specific industry, given your specific organization is critically important. The other reason why you wanna bring legal in though, as, an outside, as outside counsel is for the purposes of privilege. Typically when an incident occurs, the first call you wanna make is to your attorney. And the reason being is because then your attorney can hire on your behalf the forensics team that's going to do the investigation, the restoration team that's going to bring your network back online, the e-discovery vendor that's going to go through and identify what is actually in the data. If your attorney hires them, that can all be done under privilege, which means that you have a better chance of protecting that in information from discovery in the event of a class action suit. And class action lawsuits, as well as regulatory investigations, are happening at an increasing rate. And it's something that you want to consider at the very outset of an incident as to how you're going to put yourself in a defensible position. Other elements that you want to include in there are your insurance broker and your insurance carrier. You want to make sure you have good points of contact in that when, when an event occurs and an incident occurs, you know who to call and in what time frame. Because each insurance policy, if you have coverage, there is a very specific timeline under which you need to report it to insurance. Otherwise, they will deny coverage. And I've seen firsthand that that happens more, more frequently than anyone would like to admit. Despite the fact that you're paying your premiums every month, if you don't actually report it in a timely manner, it gives your carrier the opportunity to deny that coverage. So it's really important to make sure you have them involved as well. And then IT, not just your internal IT team, but your managed service provider and your forensics team. You need to understand who is able to best, who's in the best position to respond to an incident and to support you as you move, move through this incident. The other aspect with IT is you want to make sure that you're, you're differentiating between if you have a managed service provider 
that you're not also including that, that you're including a separate forensics team that's going to come in and do the investigation that's apart from your managed service provider. And the reason being is because you want to make sure that you've got a second or third set of eyes that's looking at the incident, where if the managed service provider may have been at fault, you could potentially have a cause of action against the managed service provider that you, you very much want to preserve. But in general, the managed service provider also has access to all of the information that's critical to responding to and recovering from the incident. And so I don't want to paint them in any way to be, be a bad actor, but making sure that you're, you're protecting yourself and your organization is really important. Talked a little bit about this already, but the external incident response team is, is an augment, is an, an outside element that is really supplementing your team. And as you do, you have an incident response plan, you need to be able to identify who these external players are going to be that you're going to bring in. And then it's really a best practice that when, when you have an incident response plan, you test it through a tabletop exercise or other type of training scenario that you are, you're bringing them into the fold as well so that everyone has the opportunity to practice together. Your internal IR team is going to be comprised of generally, and again, it's going to be different for each organization, but members of your information technology team, your legal team, your human resources, internal communications, as well as your external communications or marketing, and then operations. And the reason behind each one of these varies, but operations is going to be able to determine what the impact of the business is going to be. Human resources is going to be able to tell you what type of data may have been compromised and what the potential damage could be from personal information. And then your communications team is going to help to tailor the message out. It's going to help to tailor that message out to who needs to get it and in what, what manner to help preserve the reputation of your organization. Another critical aspect is the delegation of authority. Contrary to popular belief, incidents don't always occur between 9 to 5 Eastern Standard Time. The vast majority of incidents occur on the weekend, occur on holidays, when there are minimal manning and when the threat actors know that the monitors, the cybersecurity teams aren't going to be watching the network. As a result, there should be a delegation of authority in place within your incident response plan that gives either your chief information officer, your chief information security officer, or the in, in incident response team lead the authority to make decisions on behalf of the organization that could potentially harm the organization. And what I mean is, if there is an incident that occurs that is so complex, so sophisticated, so robust, that the only response is to unplug the network and to take the entire organization system offline in order to mitigate additional harm, that needs to be an authority that is in put in place of either the CIO or the CISO. That's not something that you have time to wake up the CEO and explain that situation to. And so having that trust, having that additional or that delegation of authority in place is really important. And then we've talked about the external IR team and why each element is very important to identify early and to practice the response with. Critical to all of this is identifying an incident response lead. And the incident response lead is going to coordinate all the activities and all the communications with all of these different entities. The incident response lead can be somebody from your IT team. It could be someone from your legal team. Typically, you don't want it being the same person who's coordinating all of the, the incident, all of the, the technical incident response efforts, because that person is going to be very, very involved, either dealing with forensics or dealing with restoration. The incident response lead should be somebody more senior, able to make decisions for the organization. From a legal perspective, legal considerations are really critical in ensuring your organization is protected and compliant throughout the incident response process. So first and foremost, having a breach coach is one of the most critical aspects. And again, shameless plug here, but an attorney that understands cybersecurity is going to help you to get back to business as fast as possible and ensuring you're meeting all of your regulatory or statutory obligations. Attorney client privilege is a big aspect of that, but also the ability to quarterback the incident response. The breach coach is essentially the quarterback who, who leads the incident and coordinates all aspects of those external parties that have been hired on your behalf. They coordinate the different teams, whether it's security, IT, communications, crisis communications, and then also with your management team and interfaces with your general counsel. Ensuring that the, they, the breach coach's responsibility is to ensure that the response is cohesive and legally sound. Compliance is another key aspect that it helps to ensure that statutory, regulatory, and contractual obligation. And contractual is not something that many organizations think about when an incident occurs. You think, what do I need to do under statute? What do I need to do in my specific industry? But in a lot of cases, more and more 
companies, vendors, partners, customers are including in contracts a requirement for notification if any of their data has been compromised. And that notification period can be 24 hours from the date of the breach itself. It can be 24 hours from the date of identification. Knowing what your obligations are under your contracts is also important to ensure that you don't fall in breach of contract. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gray. Thank you, Mike. This, as a matter of the overall preparation piece, there's going to be a lot of action and, and work that takes place well before this stage uh, in, in the securing of the insurance, applying for the insurance, negotiating the insurance, et cetera. What we're really going to focus on today is once we've got that, you know, how does that interrelate with regards to the incident response plan? And Mike had a good point earlier, even if we don't have insurance in place, you still need to focus on some of these key things with regards to who, who your breach coach, your uh, incident you know, response folks, and, and you know, other key actors along the way with regards to recovery are identified. So first and foremost, you know, from an insurance perspective, all of the insurance companies either have a predetermined panel of responders or they will allow you some flexibility with regards to selection of people you know, with, within a particular list of these predetermined folks. My recommendation is whether or not you have specific contacts, if you can identify those people to help you put this game plan in place, get those people pre-approved, let's identify them up front so that in the event we have a crisis, we're not looking around, you know, wondering who we call next. If the vendor is not pre-approved uh, by the insurance companies, a lot of times they, we will not have coverage or the, the payments will be reduced uh, with regards to the reimbursements on that. So if you need assistance getting that done, your insurance broker agent should be able to help you with that. The, the second key piece is really understanding your coverage, right? The, the cyber policies are becoming more and more common with regards to the, the breadth of the coverage, but it's still a very sophisticated coverage offering multiple aspects of both third party and first party risk exposure uh, coverage. So understand your policies, understand how each of those seg segments is going to react, and then also understand your obligations with regards to reporting an incident versus you know, what we know is a claim, right? Because there are some nuances with that. And then lastly, as we are putting together the incident response plan and going through the tabletop exercises, make sure and include the insurance process as part of that uh, transaction in response so that we're not skipping steps. Thank you, Gray. I'll take over from here. So uh, let's talk about the IT preparation. Now, IT preparation is going to require a few things from you. That's knowing where the data in your environment exists and knowing the, the different workflows that are necessary for your business to conduct business itself. Now, on top of that, you're going to need to know the different standard IT security tooling, toolings that's protecting your environment and put them in place. For instance, immutable backups, which would protect you from ransomware. Industry standard uh, tools like MDR, SIM, S, uh, or SOC, as well as conditional multi-factor authentication. Finally, you want to make sure that you have a incident response plan in place, and more so not just an incident response plan, but a business continuity plan to ensure these workflows are maintained so you can continue operating even if you're impaired uh, from any kind of adverse event. Let's uh, close out this and move on to the response phase. So I'm going to talk about the technical response. And this is going to be basically using the IT preparation pieces that we put in place to provide a response uh, step by step. So in the technical response, we have really six items here, but there are five main items that my team would be responsible for. And that's detection, validation, eradication recovery, and I think I missed one, uh, containment. And in between those, you'll see that there's a six, which is the incident response lead, which is where we're jumping off to talk to them and notify them of what we found. Detection is the initial detection of the security event. Now, notice I'm using very specific language there. That is security event, not incident. Validation is going through the event, figuring out if it's true positive and trying to understand, at least get an initial understanding of the impact that it's having on the environment. 
At this point, we'll reach out to the incident response lead, we'll give them this information, allowing them to determine if this violates CIA within their organization and who they need to reach out to. Uh, usually they'll follow up with counsel shortly after to get a, a understanding of where they should go from there. Following that, we're gonna work on containment. Well, containment is the containment of the threat. That's gonna be setting up a, a barrier to ensure that nobody else can get in and that we have no other threats that are spreading throughout the environment and containing that damage. Eradication is the removal of a threat. That could, uh, that could be the removal of tooling, accounts, or compromised entry points. Um, and then we have finally recovery, which is the restoration of services and workflows for the business, taking into account that other systems could have been compromised and <clears throat> doing it with caution in order to ensure that the restoration of assets are not currently compromised as well. And we're going to see that here in just a second where I walk through a couple of cases and describe why. I'd like to give you some examples and here's exactly what they look like. So in case one, we have a healthcare company and we start off with detection. Well, we, per we did not detect this particular event. It was detected by the users themselves. Uh, they had some odd emails that were coming through and uh, that currently they didn't have missing, or they had missing tooling, so they couldn't detect it on there. We couldn't detect it for them. Validation, uh, well, myself and some technicians began an investigation revealing that this was not the first time this was affected, or this was not the first user that was affected. We pulled some login record, records for all users that were affected within the environment or every single user that exists within the environment and narrowed it down to about nine to ten users once we had them we started pulling through information and timelines to tell us when the last or when the exact first moment occurred that we see this particular login um, then we tracked down that user's email we did a trace and we found that phishing emails were coming in at that at the very first time about four days earlier earlier than what they had described to us in the initial the initial detection well, we then realized that the session for these accounts had been used, fished from this particular this user and all the other users and set up and used to set up persistence through what's known as a session replay. Once we had uh, figured out that a session replay had been created, we had to dig through some additional logging and we found that an app had been designed to download the user's email and create persistence within the environment. We were certain that this was an active threat. So we reached out to the, the incident response lead, or, or at least our POC at the time. And we explained to them the situation. And then at the same time, we began containment. And the reason we took steps for containment was to ensure that no further action could be taken by this threat actor and no further loss could occur. And in containment, we blocked the IPs of that user through conditional access and reset all of the affected user's passwords and then set in place a plan to reset all passwords and revoke all access for current users within the environment because we could not trust the environment. Once that was locked down, we removed the ability to consent for any kind of enterprise apps, since this was what was being used for persistence. Then we monitored the connections attempts and confirmed that no further attempts were successful. All we saw was unsuccessful attempts by the threat actor. Eradication was the removal of all the apps. This was happening simultaneously once we had begun the containment and pulling of all phishing emails from the user's mailboxes. Recovery was ensuring that these users had access to whatever they needed to continue working again. And we'll move on to the second case. The second case is a little different. And the importance here between the two cases, something that we need to take away from this, is an incident response plan would allow the company to say this is what needs to happen from this point forward but each event's going to be different it's going to provide a different level of of severity it's going to provide a different level of uh, I, I would say shock factor really and in this particular in the manufacturing case we have detection which came through a down detector that we have for the customer uh, the down detector told us that late at night one machine went down and then early in the morning all the following machines went down. Now this is every single server within the environment was now down. Further investigation onto their VMware hosts inside of detection. 
well, sorry, excuse me, inside of validation allowed us to actually dig through just the VMware host in which we found a readme that said, hey, every single server is encrypted and you need to pay us money in order to get access to these servers again. Well, we we don't uh, we don't uh, negotiate with terrorists here. So we end up uh, ensuring that we have the immutable backups in place to provide access back to the company. However, we don't really have enough information to go off of when this occurred. Um, containment is really just going to be a matter of us making sure nothing has access to the environment but us through very secured channels. We don't have a way to tell where it came from. Luckily, while we were doing this, we were working with the POC to explain to them that, hey, yeah, you're your business is down, which we had to tell them right away. And I'm sure they had no issue figuring that out since it could not work. Um, we found that a child company had actually caused the initial infection through an outside connection. We had disabled that connection in our initial validation. Following through with that, we, we worked to coordinate with them some additional timelines to actually figure out if our hypothesis was correct. We confirmed that they did have access through a P2P VPN. So, we systematically had to do what, what I'm going to collectively call an eradication and recovery all at the same time, which is we remove the accounts that we believe are, are being used for this malicious, this malicious threat, as well as recovering all of the servers that we need at the exact same time. And we had to do this in virtual in order to bring these up so they can eventually work. It's worth noting that this took an extremely large amount of effort on our end, as well as the business's end, and money that they were losing daily because they could not get access to their environment. This is just one aspect. If we, if we had, had built out another way or failover for them to have their stuff up instantly in one location, if we had better logging, that we, when we knew that there were specific timelines that they came in and decided to start encrypting everything or a suspicious location login, that would have helped us a lot more. It's worth noting also that at this time the business had not contacted counsel <clears throat> or the insurer. And at this point, two weeks has gone by. Two weeks of, of downtime. So we're seeing we're seeing dramatic loss. Maximum downtime or tolerable downtime had been exceeded by at least three days. And the pain point was was growing day by day. And this is the kind of the kind of interaction you see with businesses where if they don't have insurance, they don't have counsel backing them up you see businesses fail from this. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and move on to the business response with Mike. Thanks, Seth. So on the business response front, it's important to recognize that there is not just one linear access or one, one linear access that we, we function on in responding to an incident. The technical response is critical but it's not the only response. We also need to make sure that there is an appropriate business response. So while the technical response is making sure that you're getting the network back up and running, the business response is also critically important because it's making sure that you're able to get back to business as usual, or at least have a continuity of operations such that you can continue functioning despite the fact that you're fighting an ongoing incident. The first aspect of a business response and an effective business response is to bring in your leadership. Your leadership has to understand that incidents occur. And just in general, incidents are part of operating in a technical environment. Make sure that your, your leadership understands that not only do they occur, but that you have a process to manage to handle it and that you've mitigated risk as best you can. And now you're fighting through the incident. The other aspect of this, and I touched on this a little bit with the continuity of operations, but part of making sure that your leadership is well informed and is able to, to keep a cool head about them as we move through this, this incident is making sure that you have a business continuity plan. It really isn't just enough to have that incident response plan, but it's how is your business going to continue to operate if certain systems go down? And now, Seth talked a little bit about being well beyond that acceptable, acceptable downtime. How would your company operate if you exceed that acceptable downtime? Do you have a backup plan in place? Is there a way for to utilize alternate communications? Do you have a plan to communicate with your customers, with your partners, with your vendors? To be able to coordinate across all functions, both within your organization and outside of your organization, ensures that continuity of operations. It also ensures that the affected systems and users have the ability to work from a backup operating plan to really minimize that downtime. 
The final aspect of this business response is being able to return to a normal operations. Normal operations may look a little bit different after the incident than they did before the incident. It may also take quite a while to return to those normal operations. So the question becomes, how quickly can you get back to normal operations in light of the incident as you move through that continuity of operations or move through your business continuity plan? This is something that doesn't just happen. It's something that you need to practice and work through through tabletop exercises and other types of exercises where you're drilling your incident response plan and you're drilling the personnel within your organization, training them so that they have an understanding of what they're supposed to do in the event of an incident. And the third prong of this right of boom response is the incident response. So we've got the technical response where it's your IT team working through the incident, making sure that they are safeguarding and securing your network. We've got the business response. We're making sure that you can continue operations. And then we get to the incident response. And critical of the incident response is the breach coach. That's the attorney that you're bringing in. Because again, that attorney serves as that quarterback that's going to lead the incident and make sure that every step that it's taken is in compliance with statute, in compliance with regulation, and putting you in a defensible position on the back end of the incident. The incident response team, external and internal, really focuses on identifying what the root cause was of the incident, ensuring that we have the proper backups from a last trusted time period, working with insurance, working with e-discovery to determine what the overall scope of the incident was, the scope of the breach, the types of data that was impacted, which leads to what notifications have to be done to which regulators, to which in individuals, and to which state attorneys general, and then the after action. And the after action really is critical as well because this is where we learn, this is where we get better. So within the incident response framework, the breach coach is not just a lawyer. Uh, a breach coach is an attorney that specializes in cybersecurity and data breaches, and their expertise is really vital in effectively navigating the legal and procedural complexities of an incident. So the role of a breach coach, it's to review contractual and regulatory requirements, making sure that the requirements that are specific to your organization are being met and you're fully aware of all of those obligations. Drafting and reviewing communications, making sure that that crisis communication, those company notifications that go out to customers, to stakeholders, to shareholders, that those communications are, are, are done in such a way that's not gonna increase any sort of liability. They have to be clear and accurate. They have to make sure that they're complying with different regulatory regimes and different requirements. Then the coordination with law enforcement. There have been multiple instances where uh, we've been working cases and we have done the traditional uh, law enforcement notification to the FBI, to the Secret Service, in some cases to the Department of State, uh, where those law enforcement entities come back and they've been able to provide a decryptor, which has opened up the network and made it so a client doesn't have to pay the ransom. I've had it where the FBI has done direct coordination with foreign law enforcement that has been able to freeze cloud instances and secure the data and safeguard the data in those foreign cloud instances that the threat actor was, was, was uh, exporting the data to. These types, of, uh, these types of authorities, these types of capabilities, they're only resident within law enforcement. And so not something to be afraid of, but it needs to be coordinated effectively. And the type of information that's being shared, once it's shared with law enforcement, generally loses that privilege. So the attorney very much needs to ensure that the information that's being shared is such something that is acceptable if it were to be discoverable later. And then it's communicate with customers and stakeholders, making sure that you have a good plan to, to dampen down any of the effects of the incident and that you're telling, you're, you're communicating effectively across all of the stakeholders, across those within and, and outside of your organization to manage your reputation and to provide assurances to customers so that they don't leave as a result of this incident. And then the final piece is working with digital forensics and the incident response team. The breach coach works really closely with digital forensics. And this is why it's important to have an attorney that specializes in, in cybersecurity incidents. Understanding the technical aspect of it in driving forensics is really important because there are some instances where you don't want to know root cause. There are some instances where if you'd identify what the root cause is, it may give rise to a claim of negligence. And in that case, it's better not to have that information. But knowing when to direct an incident response team to stop looking or when to direct an incident response team to dig deeper is something that an attorney who has a good understanding of forensics and a good understanding of cybersecurity can provide. So the breach coach plays a really pivotal role in incident response and, and acts as that quarterback, ensuring that all aspects of the response are cohesive, compliant, 
and effective. The next aspect, and I touched on this a little bit, but DFIR, so Digital Forensics and Incident Response. The primary objective of DFIR is to uncover the full scope of the incident. And this involves identifying how the incident occurred, if, if directed by the breach coach, determining the extent of the breach, which is critically important to understanding what the notification process is, because you need to know and understand what the data is, and then understand the impact of the organization's systems or data. Insurance is another critical piece, which I'll turn over to, to Gray to touch on. Thank you very much. I think the key thing to recognize here as an observation is, you know, this makes the expectation and assumption that we have done the proper preparation, gotten the insurance, you know, built into this incidents response plan uh, properly, and so that we're not waiting on an insurance company to tell us what to do next. Uh, rather, we're getting the breach codes, the DFIR involved, and then we can work with the insurance companies to make sure we're getting proper claim filing notice, um, coordinating the interaction with our with our service providers and other vendors, and then one of the advantages here, you know, handling it properly this way is most of the policies that are structured today are on a pay on behalf of form. So if we've done the proper homework and pre work with regards to setting this plan up, we don't as a as a, uh, an insured we don't have to have the cash outlay to pay for these bills and then expect to wait for reimbursement. The insurance company will actually pay on behalf of for the approved bills and on a, on a more timely manner. Which leads us to e-discovery. E-discovery is an important part of understanding what the full scope of the full scope of the, the data breach is. And now at this point, we we shift from the term incident to breach because once once data is compromised, it's considered breached and it's subject to various laws and regulations. The different types of data that we're really looking for in e-discovery process are PII, PHI, uh, payment card information, if you're working with the DOD or with the federal government controlled unclassified information, and then certainly intellectual property. All of these different types of information are going to determine how you respond to an incident. Because if you understand that you have trade secrets that are part of a data set that were compromised, you may be willing to pay to have that data or to protect that information and make sure it doesn't get leaked on the dark web. Similarly, with PHI or PII, you want to limit exposure, limit information being leaked that could be sensitive to individuals. This type, this part of the incident response process is generally one of the more expensive. Depending on the, the amount of data, it can range from anywhere from thirty to fifty thousand dollars, all the way up to half a million, just to do the e-discovery. And so, understanding this process, understanding the scope of it, and understanding the potential costs are also really important. And then we get to the notification process. There are, from an incident response perspective. There are 50 different breach notification laws for each state, as well as two, one for DC, one for Puerto Rico. All of these cover individual notifications, and in general, it comprises any information that contains first name or first initial and last name in conjunction with social security number, driver's license number, information that would give access to a financial account, username and password to email account or any other type of account, medical or health information, and in two states, it's also date of birth. But that data, if that is in a data set, needs to go or needs to be reported to those individuals under the, the state notification law. And importantly, it's not where your organization is as to which law applies, it's where those individuals are a resident at the time of the breach. It also is important that those notification laws depending on which state they are, varies widely as to whether or not you need to notify the attorney general. For instance, in North Carolina, a single individual or a single resident of the state of North Carolina being involved in a data breach obligates you to notify the state attorney general. Other states have a minimum threshold of 500 or 1,000, but it's important to understand where those states are and where the, the data subjects in the breach are residents. And then there's the regulatory compliance. If you're in a specialized or highly regulated industry, you generally are understanding or aware of the different requirements you have. Importantly, though, if you're in critical infrastructure, the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act, which passed in 2021 and is in the rulemaking process right now, is going to apply very broadly across all critical infrastructure sectors. 
the vast majority of organizations in this country are considered critical infrastructure. So it's important also to understand what your reporting requirements are under CERCIA. And then there are media notifications that are required under various regulations, which put the breach out and make sure that it makes sure that the, the data breach uh, or the data subjects are aware. It also opens you up to liability. And so knowing what needs to go in those media notifications, when and where they need to go out is critically important from a notification process. And then finally, we get to the after action items. And this is these are the lessons learned. So once everything is done, we do a hot wash. And we go through and we say, from a legal perspective, what do we do well? What do we now know that that is in our uh, that that we're required to do? Same with technical, insurance, and business. What do we need to do better? What do we need to put in place? What are the what are the either technical, procedural, or personnel changes that need to be made to ensure that we are able to identify and mitigate any breach that occurs in the future? From a legal perspective, class action mitigation is critical. It used to be if you have a hundred thousand people in your data set or that have been compromised as part of an incident, that's the threshold for class action liability. That's where plaintiffs firms see really being able to make money on those types of cases. I have two ongoing class action cases right now, one in the 2000 individual range, one in the 3000 individual range. Almost immediately class action suits were filed as soon as the notifications went out. The threshold or the, or the floor for class action liability has gone down significantly. And you can almost guarantee if you suffer from an incident that you have to notify, you're going to have a class action lawsuit filed against you. How do you mitigate that? How do you put yourself in a defensible position is really important. Turn this over to Seth for the technical response. So I would, I would clarify that the after action for technical is more of a what did you learn from this experience especially if you don't have an incident response plan and hopefully you learned a lot so that way you can make the changes that are necessary typically what i see is a huge correction from people who don't have incident response um filling of gaps that they that they perceived were there as well as the gaps that that were actually there um purchasing a lot more technical uh mostly technical, most mostly big dollar spins, things that they can actually correct right away. Uh, but this is going to be on the whole, how are you going to avoid this in the future? What are you learning from that? And the technical aspect should give you not only just tooling, but should give you um, NIST governance pieces that you need to address and policies that should be in place. And with that, uh, we can move up to the insurance, I believe. And so a couple of comments here with regards to again, stepping back, taking a big picture look, the, the after action review from an insurance perspective, I think can be looked at in multiple phases of this process. Um, after we've put the initial plan in place and we've done tabletop exercises, we may tweak what we've got. Um, certainly seeing um, other claim scenarios along the way, we can confirm what coverage we may need to negotiate at a subsequent renewal. Um, but in the event of going through this entire process because we've had a claim, the, the biggest message is, you know, for the next renewal, we most likely will be facing some changes with regards to insurance pro the insurance program. The best way we can help defend against that and, and combat that on the front end is, is making sure that the underwriting community understands what that we know what happened, we took action to avoid it happening again, and in many cases we might even share uh, large elements of the incident response plan, you know, with the underwriting community to help them in the underwriting process look at your particular risk as a better risk than it used to be, you know, pre-incident or pre-breach. Um, lastly, you know, from a severity perspective, if if we don't do anything and we just continue operating as forward, it's very possible that we may have we may face a number of declinations and and be uh, very challenged to even find insurance or have non-renewals. And then I think the last piece we have here, I'll pass it back to the uh, business response. The final piece of the after action is the business. And how do you manage post incident? And in a lot of cases, companies look at an incident as a black eye, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. The way that you couch the information, the way that you, you share information with your, your constituents, with your stakeholders, with your customers, can largely determine how you rebound from the incident from a business perspective. Reputation management is important. Whether or not you do a press release is a business decision, but one that can show transparency. 
whether or not you include regular updates to your customers on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly basis as you're going through the incident can help to mitigate some of the potential harm from a business perspective and also helps to inure trust in those individuals or in those organizations. Reviewing your business response plan helps to reduce downtime, downtime and disruption from future incidents. So as an after action, you're going to want to look at what did you do well from a reputation perspective? What did you do well from a business response perspective and continuity of operations? And how can you improve? And then finally, reviewing that incident response plan. It's a living framework. It's a living document. Make sure that you're addressing gaps, not just from the technical perspective, not just from the response perspective, but also from the business perspective. Do you have the right people on your incident response team? Are you informing the right stakeholders within and outside of your organization? All of these gaps need to be addressed in order to have an effective after action to make sure that you can continue building, you can continue to respond well to these types of incidents, which are going to continue to occur. So what's next? Key takeaways from here, what do you do, where do you go? Um, it's important, identify and assemble an incident response team. Determine who needs to be on your internal team, who's gonna lead it, and what are the functional leads gonna be? Who do you need that are gonna be stakeholders? The external team, who's your breach coach? Who's gonna be your forensics team? Who is your cyber insurance? Whether you have in cyber insurance or not, it's a good, good exercise to go through to determine whether or not you need it and what are the applications of that and what are the, the pros and cons. And then with the breach coach and the DFIR vendor, are they on your cyber insurance carrier panel or can you get them approved as an endorsement on your policy? And then finally, who's your information technology, your managed service provider, your managed security service provider? Who are they? How, how rolled into the incident response plan, the incident response team are they? And then making sure that you're exercising that and exercising your incident response plan with all of those stakeholders on a regular basis. The legal preparation, you're going to want to review of contracts well in advance of a breach with your breach coach to make sure that you understand what the timelines are and what the potential ramifications are of an incident on your different customers. If you're able to standardize your contracts as it relates to cybersecurity and in incidents in general, that's ideal. But in some cases, you can't do that. So understanding what your obligations are under those contracts is important. Making sure you comply with the terms of those contracts is equally important. And then understanding what statutory and regulatory frameworks you're operating on under given your industry. I'll turn this one over to Gray for the insurance preparation. You're on mute, Gray. Excuse me. We've talked a lot about these key pieces throughout the presentation, Mike. It's, you know, the pre-approval and the preparation is key uh, with this particular element, understanding uh, your coverage and then reviewing that as it relates to the uh, incident incidents response plan. And for IT preparation, you're going to want to make sure that you review, again, the location of your data, knowing the workflows that your business needs in order to actually function should there be an adverse event. And then you're going to want to make sure that you have the standard security tools that we mentioned before, NDR, SOC SIM, conditional MFA. And then you want to be able to have a technical response, create plans, test them. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard I have an incident response plan. I have a business continuity plan and they've never been tested. They have never been tried. That is the key. Test, learn. So that way you can actually be prepared. Thank you. All right. So why everybody came here? How do you create your first incident response plan? We're gonna provide a template to you that you can receive if you request it at the end of the survey. Um, this template is gonna help get you started. But if you have questions about going through the process, we are here, we're available to assist you through it. And everybody does need an incident response plan and making sure that it's robust and it's effective and then testing training. Um, if you have questions, if there's any way that we can support, uh, Aldridge, Higginbotham and Buchanan are here to provide that support and we'll make ourselves available at any time.